Let's go to the Lord one more time. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for your word and what it teaches about who you are and shows us salvation, Lord. We thank you for this worship service this morning, Lord, and I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, Lord. Teach us what you would have for us to know this morning. Lord, I pray that you would fill my mouth with your words. Lord, for we want a word from God, not a word from man, Lord. And that these seeds would take root in our heart, Lord, and that we would hide them, that we may not sin against you. And bless this message, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. If you would, turn with me to Genesis 15. And go back to the beginning. Um, so many things in, you know, obviously the, the whole Bible has a continual theme. And you see the same types played out again and again throughout the Bible. And when you go back to, when you go back to Genesis, obviously the beginning, um, and that's my favorite, my favorite words in all the Bible are in the beginning God. You have to start there. If nothing else after that makes sense, well, you'll see the whole picture unless you start there. That in the beginning God, everything originates with God. Everything is kept together in God. Everything comes from God. And you have to start there. So I love when I go back to to Genesis. And we're going to go through Genesis 15, and I know it's a familiar story. But there's re there's reason that they're familiar stories, is because there's so much good in them that, um, that we keep going back to that well <laughs> again and again, because we'll never be able to plumb the depths of what it is. And I know I've said it many times, that even in, in the New Testament, if you take the last week of Jesus's life from the time that he comes into Jerusalem to his crucifixion and resurrection you take that last little bit of his life you can study everything you can study that for your entire lifetime and I don't think you'd ever grasp everything that's going on and part of that is because th th for me when we try to study and we try to grasp who God is obviously we can't do it in our finite minds and our finite bodies right but, but part of that that goes along with that is because God has characteristics and God has attributes that we can't, we don't even understand. You know, you try to talk about the attributes of God, the love, the kindness, the forbearance. God has attributes, I'm fully convinced, that we don't even know, that we can't even understand. So there's no way, you know, it's, the, the analogy goes that you walk up to the ocean with your teacup and you say, all right, I'm going to understand all there is about God. Well, you're never going to put the ocean in your teacup, right? You may get a sense of it. You may be able to taste it. You may be able to see its power. But you're never going to understand it fully. You're never going to fully grasp it. And this is the same thing with this. Um, but we're going to go through the whole chapter. I, you know, um, there's so much here that I'm not going to hit every detail. But, um, but I love this story, and it's about how God, from the very beginning, had his plan and how things were going to play out, right? It wasn't that God was reacting to what man was doing and just making it up as he goes. Because you see these same themes that are played out again and again and again. You know, even from the very beginning when God um, tells Adam, you know, in, in the garden and preaches the gospel to him. You know, he, he talks to Satan, he talks to the woman, he talks to the man, and he, he, he preaches the gospel through that whole thing. That it wasn't, that the, the idea of Jesus coming and laying down his life was something, was the plan from the very beginning. And, and that, that same theme plays out in that again and again. So let's read through this real quickly, then we'll go back through it. Uh, 15 verse 1 after these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying do not fear Abram I am a shield to you your reward shall be very great Abram said O Lord God what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus 
And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house, one not one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look for, toward the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of, of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? And he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Adam drove them away. Now when the sun was gone, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, terror and a great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation they will serve and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It came about when the sun had set, that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which, which passed between these pieces. And the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Your descendants I have given this land. From the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Kadmonite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Raphim and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Gilgashite and the Jebusite. So there's a lot that's going on here. Um, but we go back to verse 1, right? It says, after these things. Well, after what things? Right? You always have to grab the context of what's going on. So like, we, like I talked a little bit about this morning earlier, this is just after Abram had returned from rescuing Lot from the other kings, from the wicked kings, right? And we talked about um, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and he gives the bread and the wine, right, and gives uh, Abram a blessing, but he's also offered all this, the spoils of war by the king of Sodom. And he doesn't want anything to do with the king of Sodom, right? He doesn't want to be beholden to this... Uh, to this man. And I'm sure Abram living in the land knew who these people were, right? The, the Sodomites didn't turn that way shortly after, you know, Abram went to war with them, right? And when he came back, when he, when he rescued Lot, I mean, he knew who they were, right? He said, no, no, I don't want anything to do with you. And in a way, that's Abram showing that he still believe, that he believes God this entire time, that God's going to bless him and give him the land, right? He doesn't necessarily know how yet, but he still believes. So the word of the Lord came to Abraham saying, do not fear, Abram. And I like this, do not fear. A lot of times when, when people have these visions, they see God, they meet an angel, right? The very first thing that they have to say is, don't be afraid. Because it's got to be scary, right? Just the power and, and everything that you would coming into contact with a being like that, right? And that's what, when people say stuff like, oh, we're going to give Satan a black eye or we're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan. No, if you went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan, you'd probably die of fright, right? I mean, he's, it's that awesome. I mean, if you're that scared of coming, you know, people, when they come... Um, Gabriel would give them a message, right? They're scared. I mean, if you're that scared of somebody who's bringing you a good message, you know, imagine how scared you'd be about that. So yeah, so the, God says to him, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. I am your protector. Now, and part of that may be because Abraham was wondering in the back of his mind, like these kings are probably going to want some revenge. Right? I just sacked them and took away all the stuff that they won in war before. I mean, they're gonna, these guys might come hunting for me. But God says, I'm your shield. And your reward shall be very great. And it's the same reward 
that, that he had the choices with the king of Sodom and the king of Salem. What kind of reward are you looking for? Are you looking for a heavenly reward, a blessing? Or are you looking for an earthly reward? Are you trying to get ahead here? Or are you trying to get ahead in heaven? Are you trying to store your treasures up in heaven? So he has a choice. He says, your reward will be great. And Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Now this isn't, I don't think that this is Abram being like, well, God, you said you're going to do all this stuff, but like, come on, we're, you know, I'm not getting any younger here. I don't think that it's, I don't think that it's Abraham questioning God and his ability to fulfill his promise. He's just kind of like, I don't see how this is going to work out. I'm not the youngest guy in the world. At this time, Abram's probably about 85 years old. I mean, he was, it, previously in Genesis, it tells us he was 75, right? 76. And then this is about 10 years later. So he's not getting any younger, right? So he's just like, listen. And, and I think in a way, he's, look, my servant is my heir right now because I have no children. I don't even have a son-in-law to leave this stuff to. Like who, how is this going to figure out? And he says this, he's not, you know, the one who's going to inherit, is it, is it my servant? Is he the one that's going to, this is going to go through? Like, I don't see this. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir. And I like how he says this man. Right? He's not even like, no, no, he doesn't even call him by name. He says, that man, no, no, that's not going to be yours. But one will come forth from your own body, and he shall be your heir. And he took him outside, and now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to them, so shall your descendants be. So he takes him outside and he goes to the, tells him to look at the stars. Right? He says, can you even count how many stars there are. Now, you got to remember, this is out where there's not like we have here. We have so much light that comes off the city that you can't really see the stars. If you're out where it's dark, you, the stars are numerous. I mean, so much more than what you see here. So he's like, you can't, can you, can you count those? Those are how many descendants you're going to have. Now, this also contrasts with what he says in, verse, in chapter 12, right? When he originally gives him, his Jesus or when God tells Abram, you know, your descendants are going to be as the dust of the earth. So I believe what God's trying to show him is, listen, you're going to have two sets of descendants, right? In two sets, you're going to, one is going to be your fleshly descendants, like God fashioned man from the dust of the earth, right? So you're going to have a lineage. You're going to have a blood lineage that's going to be many descendants, but when he shows him the heavens, shows him the stars, I think what he's telling him is you're also going to have descendants from heaven in a heavenly sense. Because in one sense, we all, all believers are very much the descendants of Abraham, right? Because we've been grafted in to the tree. We've been grafted into the root. So we don't, in that sense, we don't replace Israel, and we don't replace the Jews in a fleshly sense. But in a spiritual sense, we become a part of that nation because God has, gra has grafted us in. Right? So he's, he's showing Abraham, Listen, you're going to have two, trust me, you're going to have two sets of descendants. And there's going to be so many of them that you won't even be able to count them. It also says in Romans chapter 10 that there is no distinction Right when he's, he's writing, there's no distinction between the Greek and the Jews. In God's economy, when you're a believer, you're one and the same. Right? God doesn't have any stepchildren. He doesn't have any grandchildren. Right? When Jesus prayed and taught his disciples to pray, he said, "Our Father." Right? It doesn't matter. We're, we're God is God is all of our Father, and in the same sense, we're all the offspring. We're all the descendants of Abraham. So shall your descendants be. And then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, there are people that, um, 
will argue back and forth about, well, when did, when did Abraham get saved? Was it, you know, was it when he believed and he left his home? Or is it here when it says this? But, you know, I, I think that um, many times theologians and people that want to argue about that type of stuff are just trying to, I don't know, trying to make a name for themselves or something like that. And do Listen, it, it, the Bible says that it was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. That's good enough for me, okay? I don't need to know the moment or the exact second or what did he say or what it look he believed, okay? We, it isn't about, a, even for us, it isn't about a prayer that you pray. It, it isn't about a, a ritual. It isn't about a moment, right? It's, it, the moment that counts is the moment that you believe, but what, did, but what did Abram believe? Like, it's not enough to just say, oh, I believe in God, right? Abram didn't, didn't just say, oh, I believe in God. There are plenty of people that aren't Christians that say they believe in God. There are plenty of people that say, well, it's all these different religions. They all take you to the same God. You know, well, I, I believe there's a God. It, that's not enough, right? That's not what Abram believed. And it's also... Um, it's not to believe that God exists and not also to believe, but to believe, you're, sorry, you're going to believe that what he says is true. Everything that God says and promises you, everything that God says about himself, you believe that that is true. And if you believe that everything that God says about himself is true, then you have to believe that everything that God's word says about his son is true. And everything that the son said about himself was true. It's not just enough to believe that they exist, but you also have to believe that they are who that they say they are. Yes. And you see, many times in the New Testament, this point is brought out, right? Romans 4, chapter 3, or Romans 4, 3, Abram believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Galatians 3, 6, just as Abram believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. James 2, 23, and the scripture was fulfilled saying, Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. So that's where our belief must extend. Not only that God exists, but he believe, that he is who he says he is and he will do what he says he's going to do. Verse 7, and he came to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave you this land to possess it. And he said, O oh Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? Now, again, this isn't Abraham being like, God, you have to prove yourself. You have to prove yourself. Because he's not asking, he's not making an unreasonable request. Like, I don't, I don't get what's going on around here. Okay, so how am I going to know that we're going to possess this land? And that's not really much different than what we, I mean, our faith is not a blind faith, right? It's not unreasonable for somebody to ask, well, how do I know that I can be saved? How do I know that I get to go to heaven, right? So, but the answer isn't really that much different. Because what we'll see here, the, the answer that God gives Abram is very similar to the answer that we can give, right? Because God said so, right? And, and, and there's a ritual that takes place that only God does that's the basis for our faith. And it's the basis for our salvation, right? We don't play any part. There isn't something that we do to earn our salvation. There isn't anything that Abram did on, of himself to earn this blessing, but God does tell him to do something. He says to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Those are very specific things. I mean, they each have to be three-year-old, and then a dove and a pigeon. So why, why is God specific about these animals that, the, that he's going to bring? Now, it'll come up a little bit later, but... Part of that is God's going to pronounce a prophecy over Abraham's descendants, right? And it's what these animals represent. And we'll, get, we'll go over that just a little bit. But remember that there, you have three and three and three and then the two birds. Okay, so just hold on to that piece for, for a second. 
Verse 10, and he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. Now, this is a, this way of making a covenant was a common practice at that time, right? Then when, when a, a patriarch or a king would make a covenant with his people, they would take an animal and they would cut it and they would make this covenant. And the idea being that if you broke the covenant, the same thing that happened to this animal is what should happen to you. You should be cut off. You should be killed. Like there's, there's a price that has to be paid for breaking this covenant. So this was something that happens. And I love how historians, right, they'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, this was thing. And this is the Bible taking it from culture. Well, no, how about the culture took it from God because they all came. You know, it wasn't that long ago that they were all together with Noah, right? So these common practices that you see through there, it wasn't necessarily that, that the people, that God's people are borrowing from culture. It's that there's aspects that we know that every, every human knows that God's given to us, right? If you, you, you look at um, morality and you look at laws through different cultures that are separated by time and space, generally they have about the same rules, right? Don't kill each other. Don't steal from each other. Be nice to each other. They all have some concept of, they generally all have some concept of God, right? Some form of worship. There's these common aspects, right? They, even though they're separated by time and space, these cultures have these same aspects, right? So it's the same piece, too. So it's a common practice. And it, it was actually called cutting a covenant. That was the term that they used in that time when they made a covenant. We're going to cut this covenant. We're going to cut this animal. But remember, he doesn't cut the two birds. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, verse 11, and Abram drove them away. And when the sun had gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Now these birds of prey, right? Throughout the Bible, you see birds of prey are representative of evil forces. Uh, demons, Satan, what are these birds of prey, right? So why does the Bible make detail of that Abraham is out here having to drive these birds away? Well, for one, I think that, you know, this was probably fairly early in the morning that Abraham started, got these animals and cut them, right? Because you don't want to be, <laughs> you don't want God to show up. And you slept in. And you're like, he's like, hey, I'm ready. And you're like, well, hold on a minute. I have to go get the, the animals. I got to go. I got to cut it. Wait, hold on a second, God. You know, I'm pretty sure Abram was probably out there fairly early in the morning because he wanted to be ready when God showed up. Right. He didn't want to be wait. He didn't want to wait. He didn't want God waiting on him. So he's out there all day. In the hot sun and these birds come and he's having to drive them off. And I don't know, even if you just try to keep a fly off of your food. Right. It can be aggravating. And you've got these animals out here, and if you've ever seen vultures on a carcass, I mean, they're unrelenting, right? So he's out here all day. But why, what's the point also from that? That you have Satan and his evil forces who are constantly trying to disrupt the covenant that God has with his people. They can't stop it. Right. But Satan tries to do everything he can to stop it, to disrupt it, to break it up, to make it as uncomfortable as possible on Abraham. Abraham wasn't kicked underneath of a tree all day waiting for God to show up. He had to fight. He had to work. Now, that the covenant wasn't dependent upon him. Right. It wasn't his work that brought about the covenant. But how many times in our life we know what our reward is, right? If you're a believer, you know in the end what your reward is. But at the same time, it's a battle, right? And Satan's not taking it easy, not letting you kick back underneath the tree just waiting for the end. There's an aspect of it to where there's work involved. There's work involved on your part. And are you just going to walk away? Was Abraham just going to walk away and go, man, well, maybe we'll try it again later, okay? This is too hard. Like, these birds are really being a pain god, and I just didn't feel like sticking around. You know? <laughs> How many times have we seen that in, in especially new Christians, right? They get saved, they're very excited, and then, man, this is work. Well, yeah. 
I mean, this isn't any fun anymore. I thought this was just going to be easy. Well, yeah, it doesn't always work out that way. The same thing for Abraham. He could cut him out, laid him out, and been like, okay, we'll wait for God to show up. Well, it wasn't easy. There's some work that's involved. There's a race to run. Sometimes you've got to finish it out, right? But also, if you understand that what, what God is doing here. So I kind of jump ahead a little bit in this because this, the, you got to come back to these, to these birds in another aspect. That God's going to tell Abram that your people are going to be oppressed. Right? For 400 years, you're going to be oppressed. And that's another aspect of the birds, is that Abraham's trying to fulfill what God says is going to happen, right? D trying to do his part, and these birds are oppressing him. These birds are not letting him take it easy. It's the same thing that your descendants will be oppressed by other nations and by Satan. He's going to come, he's going to come against your people. Now when the sun was gone down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, a terror and great darkness fell upon him. All right, so here, Abram again, God shows up, and he knows God's going to show up, but at the same time, when God does, he's scared. And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. So what's, what's this talking about? This is when Israel is captive in Egypt. You'll be, you'll be oppressed for 400 years. So this is the point that I believe that where, why God is specific, and he's showing Abraham, you have... A three-year-old animal, a three-year-old animal, a three-year-old animal, and then two complete animals. Right? For 300 years, the nation will be oppressed. But in the fourth, in the 400th year, right, in the fourth generation, things will be made whole again. So for 300 years, they're going to have to go through this oppression, but when the time is complete... When the time is made whole, then I'll bring your people out. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and after, afterwards you come out with many, oppression, or many possessions, right? So in the end, God judges Egypt for what they did to his people. you got to remember, now this isn't even the covenant, right? This is just God telling Abraham, you've got to understand what's at play here, right? And you know, it's kind of, kind of made me think of when people come and they say, okay, I got good news and I got bad news. What do you want first? You know, usually people are like, well, give me the bad news first. You know, and that's kind of the, what happens here. God's like, oh, I got good news and I got bad news. Well, the bad news is, is that your descendants are going to be oppressed for 400 years. And Abram's got to be thinking, well, man, this is not starting out well. You know, I thought that I thought God's going to show up and he's going to tell me how, how he's, I'm going to know that my people are going to possess the land. And he starts out with, yeah, they're going to be oppressed for 400 years. That's the bad news, right? But God wants Abram to understand his, his picture and what he has going on, right? As for you, you will go to your fathers in peace, and you'll be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now, I don't know when it talks about the iniquity of the Amorite. I, I don't know <laughs> what that means. That's kind of, a strange, kind of a strange little phrase, right? For the sins of the Amorite... The iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now, Amorite can mean an, uh, Amorite can mean a couple of different things, right? It was, but generally, um, the 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 definition that I think fits well and 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 seems to be a general consensus is that they, they so the Amorites were these nomadic people, right? And a lot of them also had tribes of giants that were involved with them, and 
but you think about it, right? Here's, here's Abram who said he's being told the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Well, the Amorite was his ally. Who, who, did, who did, if you go back to, um, if you go back to 14 verse 13, right? When, when, who did Abram go to when he went to go get Lot? Well, then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew, now who was living at the Oaks of Marme, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol and brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abram. So in some sense, Abram was allies with the Amorites because he lived in their land. So when, when God tells him the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete, we may not know what that means, but I have a pretty good idea that Abraham knew what that meant. Because even though he lived, he lived among these people, right? He wasn't part of them, but he lived among these people. So when you say, well, their iniquity is not complete, Abram probably like, oh, yeah, I could, I could see that coming. And when, you, and when you follow the Amorites, they basically later on became intermarried and everything became part of the Babylonians. Right? So all that stuff that followed the Amorites flowed right into the, flowed right into the Babylonians. Their iniquity is not yet complete. Well, what does it mean that it's not complete? It isn't in the sense that God allows, is going to say, okay, um, I'm going to just look over their sin until they sin to a certain extent. Right? There's not a cap on how much sin you can do, and then God's going to judge you. Right? There's, not, there's not a set like that. But that the time for God's plan and the time for God's judgment had not yet come against that nation. And we see that even in our own country. I believe there's judgment has to fall on our country. Right? I mean, how many babies have we aborted? How many th- how many times have we written laws that are complete affronts to God, kick God out of our school? I mean, you you can number our sins. But yet judgment hasn't fallen completely. I mean, we're still a nation, right? I it'll come. I truly believe it's coming and it's going to be sooner than later. But yet, our time's not complete. For God, and it's not that God's going to allow us to sin to a certain extent, and from that sense, but that in His plan, our time isn't complete. Same thing for the Amorites. And it came that when the sun had set, it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch that passed between the pieces. And I love, <laughs> I love this, right? So the sun fully sets now. And there's, this, there's these, these sets of animal carcasses that are laid out and the blood's mingled together. And you have a smoking oven and a flaming torch that show up. Now, I view these as two, two separate entities that show up in this. Now, and they, and they pass between the pieces. Now, like I said before, you, you have these themes that play out throughout the entire Bible that point you to Jesus as Savior, right? And it makes me think of in the garden when they're, um, when Adam and Eve, right, it says God took an animal and he slew it and gave them sins to cover them, or gave them skins to cover themselves, right? I have no doubt, I fully believe that what he did is he, he, he slaughtered a lamb, it made them clothes from lamb skin to cover them, right? To cover, because the lamb, the blood of the lamb is the only thing that can cover your sins, right? So in a way, he, he sees playing this out again and again. Now you have this where the oven and the torch show up. Now, what I believe is that this is God the Father and God the Son that show up together and they pass through the broken pieces because ultimately, salvation is a covenant between God and his son. Right? And, and, and God makes this covenant by the only constant thing in this universe, himself. He's the only person that he could make a covenant with that was going to last. Because you see him time and time again, God gives Israel something to do. And what do they do? They don't do it. They keep breaking the covenants, right? But God's, God gives this, and this is the covenant that he says. 
Your descendants I have given this land, for the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and the Kenite, and the Kenzanite, and the Kenmite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Riphium, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Jebusite, right? So he, 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 God says, I will give you this land. And you know what's going to happen because I made the covenant with myself. And God can't lie. God can't go back on his word. And throughout history, now they don't even get this and they come back and they have the land, but then the land's divided up and then they lose it and they come. Constantly they're at war. And never fully has Israel possessed the land that God promised them. But there's a time coming when Jesus returns and he defeats all of Israel's enemies that then all the land will be given to them. And when he, this is something that God made unilaterally with himself. And Jesus passed between the broken pieces and the whole ones. And it's just like when Jesus came to earth, right? He had to, he had to walk this bloody, broken world and die a bloody, broken death on our behalf so that we can be rectified with the Father. You keep seeing these, these scenes played out and out again and again. And what was, you know, what was Jesus' reward? What was the covenant that God made with Jesus? Do my will. And then what did he promise him? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Why could Abram have faith that was counted him in his righteousness because he believed that God would carry out his covenant that he made with himself. What do we believe? We believe that there's a covenant between the Father and the Son, that the Son paid the price for us, and we're his reward. God is going to exalt Jesus, right? In the end, that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow whether heaven and earth or under the earth there will be a time when we'll all together every person right even, even the demons will have to say Jesus is Lord that's our belief and it's not that much different than what Abraham went through we can only have faith in God because he made this covenant with himself. He made this decision on his own, carried it out himself, and made the covenant with himself. Therefore, we can have faith that is counted to us as righteousness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we pray that we would always believe you, who, who you are, who you say that you are, and who you say that your son is. Lord, we pray that our belief would count, be counted to us his righteousness, Lord, just the same as Abram. Lord, we thank you for today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.